What's up, YouTube? Welcome to the MCs Unscripted, where we talk to artists, entertainers, and behind the scene decision makers who are some of the best at what they do. Guys, listen. When we say entertainers and behind the scenes decision makers, what we mean is producers, writers, publishers, record label execs, and the owners too, right? What we don't mean is all of them in one person, okay? But today, that's exactly what we have. With over 120 million records sold, I mean from like JT Money to Ed Sheeran people. And listen, I'll let him tell you the rest because there's a lot more. So we're gonna have to pace ourselves, okay? We're gonna have to pace ourselves for the rest of this interview. And without further ado, you two, Mr. Tony Mercedes. What up, people? What's happening, you two? Oh, man, thank you so much for being here, man. How's your day been going? Man, you know, if it gets any better, I get worried. But it's, been, it's always it's always a good day when I wake up on the right side of the grass. You know what I mean? Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I, I got some questions here, but I want to start with, with what's behind you. What do we have back there? What are these plaques for? I mean, there's an array of plaques from, you know, from Head Shape, Shape of You all the way to, you know, uh, all the stuff I did at the Face Records, TLC No Scrubs, and just a host of others. They're, they're all over the walls. But, but it's also a constant reminder of what happened yesterday. But I, I, I can't spend a lot of time looking behind me uh, because I miss what's in front of me. So, I, 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 you know, the past is the past. I respect it, you know. But I'm definitely looking at what happens tomorrow. I like that. Before we get into the weeds, I, I just, I just want to give our audience kind of an overview of who they're actually learning from today. Can you tell me, tell me three three of your favorite artists to work with, or let's say this, your most memorable moments with these three artists that you've worked with while you were at, while you were an executive at LaFace Records before L.A. Reid took over Arista. Can you come up with any of those? Well, you know, for me, I think the most iconic and memorable time for me in terms of my career was when I was faced with the decision to continue on to pursue a particular record called Daisy Dukes, which the industry had told me that I needed to go back to the drawing board and rethink my position mm -hmm. and make more of a nationally accepted record as opposed to what they qu called a regional record. And then sitting down with the Godfather of Soul, because I lived in Augusta, Georgia, and right. I had a relationship with my granddaughter, so she set up a meeting. And for him to tell me that, uh, that a black man couldn't really start a record company, so I should forget it. Uh, to, to be able to, 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 to listen to that combined with being told that my record just wasn't good enough, but still having the, 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 the ability to find enough courage to, 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 to go against the, the grain and then put that record out independently and then be able to sell 5 million copies wow. independently. So a song called Daisy Dukes. So, so for me, when, when you talk about memorable records, I mean, that's, that's the only one because if I don't do Daisy Dukes, then guess what? There's never going to be a record called Wink, There It Is. Okay. There'll never be a record called Splacker Belly, My Baby's Daddy. There'll never be a record called Who That by JT Money. TLC will never record a song called No Scrubs, and Ed Sheeran will never have a record called Shape of You. So when you look at that, to me, that is that that one particular record, or, or just everything around that particular record, yeah. the decision, hard decision that I had to make, if I don't make that decision, then history, as we know, would be changed in terms of just how, how the history of music will, 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 will go down in terms of what happened between the years 1992 and 2022. So 30 years, 30 years of, of music would be different. No, not, 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 not because of Daisy Dukes, because a man decided to go against the grain and defy the odds. So when people say, Tony, okay, okay, Tony, Tony how would you describe you? I tell people, the only way to describe me is I'm everything that you guys said I couldn't be. I don't think that there's a person on this planet that should be able to define who you are as an individual. I think that, you know, the only way to predict your future, as Abraham Lincoln would say, it is to create it. So that's what we need to do. We just have to, we, the only way to predict our future is to create it. So that's the mode that I stay in and, and I stand firm in that. So hopefully you'll take that information and, and apply it to whatever you're doing and hopefully it'll make sense because as I'm, as I'm, as I quote a lot of times, uh, there are no unsuccessful people in the music business. They're just those who quit before their time. Ooh, that's deep. I love that. I love that. I, I that's the sentiment I give to my students all the time as well. Um, they're looking for fast fame, and I say, listen, if you're working at it, 
and you're good at it and you're getting better at it, you're working at getting better at it, it you can only fail if you stop. Um, right. That's awesome. But most musicians don't, starting out, don't know. Um, a lot of this entertainment industry runs on the backs of club and concert promoters. And I bet most people don't know that that's what you used to do. But before Daisy Dukes, even, you were a club promoter, man. I mean, yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was a concert promoter for 10 years before I ever put out a record. So once I released a record, I would go and call my, 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 my friends that were promoting concerts and say, hey, man, what you got? You know, hey, put my kid, put my, my boys on the show, you know, or, or hey, let us open up for so and so. Yeah. And, you know, so, so I had, I had a better angle that I could shoot from in, our, in, in order to get visibility for an act that no one really wanted to give an opportunity. Um, and even with, um, with uh, running up the Billboard charts, uh, even when I took my record to, to, to New York, the BLS, mm -hmm. WBS, they just said, hey, we don't play down south music. We don't really consider it hip hop. We don't, we don't support it. It doesn't work for our demographics. And, and I said, okay. So what we decided to do was, you know what? It's like, where, where's the, uh, where's your advertising department at? So <laughs> we, we went to the advertising department and said, we want to buy $10,000 worth of spots. 60 second commercials. Back then they had something called BDS, which stands for Broadcast Data Systems, which is a, a mechanism that fingerprinted your record to tell other radio stations what stations were playing it, but you never knew where the fingerprint was. So the, the stations would play a record, and if the fingerprint was in, you know, in the first three minutes or whatever, then it then it it would it would um, it would allow an imprint to be made that said, "Hey, D103 plays your record at three three p.m." Right, right. So we gambled, and we said, "Hey, listen, we want to buy sixty second commercials on BLS." And the lady said, well, what do you want the, 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 the copy to be? I said, you know what, nothing. I said, play this record for 57 seconds. And then the last three seconds, just say available in store now. To make a long story short, I called my little relatives from Brooklyn and said, hey, every time you hear this record called BLS, and say, hey, can you play that record again? Uh, to, you know, fast forward, um, BLS added the record maybe two, two weeks later, and then KISS FM came in. Maybe three weeks after that, I sold uh, I sold over four hundred thousand records in just in New York alone. True story. Wow! You have to be creative to find a way to get around the system uh, if you believe in what you're what you're playing. Is that 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 sound about right to you? Well, pretty much. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, um, there's a struggle that comes along with trying to be uh, an entrepreneur and, and and start your own company, knowing that you're underfunded and undereducated. It, 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 it's a little scary knowing that whatever money you put in this is, is probably all the money that you have. Yeah. So I always tell people where I can never outspend a Sony record or a Universal, I can outcreate them. And did I make some mistakes? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I think what, I guess one of the biggest things that I, that I, that I have that I'm proud of is Right before I put that record out, I, I, I get a call from a guy named Jerry Greenberg, who was Michael Jackson's attorney over at Sony Records. And he says, hey man, uh, Sony wants to be in the Tony Mercedes business. And we're willing to offer you today $350,000 for us to, to get that album. Now, I ain't never had 3500 you know. Right. And I, and I remember talking to my wife and my, my mother-in-law and, and I'm saying, and I told him, I said, you know what, I'm going to turn this deal down. And they thought I was absolutely insane. Why would you do that? That's a lot of money. That's, that's life-changing money. I said, yeah, it is, but that's the problem. I said, these folks got to know something that I don't know. Right. If they offered, if they offered me 50000 I'd probably sign super quick because it's like fifty grand. I ain't never had fifty grand. It's a lot of money. But they offered me 350000 That means so, there's, there's more in there. So I was having conversations with um, with a guy named Al Bell, who said, "Hey Tony, I can't offer you any money, but I can teach you the record business." So instead, of, so in lieu of taking the three hundred fifty thousand, I decided to go with Al Bell, who could offer me zero, but an opportunity to, to study under him and, and learn the business. Now, I, you know, of course, we had some questionable things in our in, during the course of our business relationship. So I always I kind of sum it up like this: I say, "Hey, you know what?" I made more money, more money with Al Bell than any other major company that I dealt with. Mm -hmm. 
but I also lost more money with him because of, of whatever deals he had going on and the things that happened during the course of our, our distribution. But if I could summarize it in, in, in some of all, I would say the learning, the, the record business is a learning experience. I just wish you guys told me how high the tuition was. <laughs> <laughs> and you wouldn't be the first nor the last to, uh, to no. learn, on, to learn on the job like that. Um, no. So, so let's go back to concert promoter. What is a concert promoter? How you get into that? Is it well? My, my, my first concert promotion was a group called JJ Fad. They had a song called Supersonic. And we're here to rock. Rhymes like ours could never be stopped. See, it's Supersonic. Okay. Um, remember that? And there was a lady out of Atlanta named Libby Anthony who who uh, was my agent, and she she contracted the date for me. I found a little skate rink in Augusta, Georgia. And Libby, thank God, decided she was going to drive down to Atlanta and kind of hold my hand, my hand through the process. Mm. I did the show. I, I, I broke even that night. But <laughs> it was a good experience because I had bug. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I went on to to graduate, and, and, and I did shows all the way at the Beacon Theater in New York. I mean, I did shows from New York all the way to, 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 to Augusta. I mean, I played in every building, you know, in between those areas. And uh, it was just, you know, you you you, you put your money up, uh, you pray that the people show up, you, you try to put together a quality show. And I was really good at really put, putting together good packages because... Where did you get the artists from? How did you, if you're, you're, you're all the way across America, coming from Augusta, where did you find these artists? How did you know it's going to be a good show? How do you know it's what the people want? Because I owned a team club. And, uh, and I guess. Okay. And, 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 and I know what records they responded to. So mm -hmm. all my concerts really cater to a younger demographic. You get what I'm saying? So they would say, you know, if I put on the supersonic record, I mean, they would just rush to the dance floor and I'm like, okay, JJ Fad's a good move. So let's try that, you know, so figure out what it was going to cost. We flew them down and pay for the hotel transportation. And then you figure out like how many people, you know, you go into a building and you say, okay, the building can hold 2,000 people. How many people do I need to break even? Right. And, and if I can break even with, with a third of the people showing up, like I said, if the building holds 2,000 and 600 people, I can break even. Then that was a good good venue because it still left me, you know, a market share of 66% of that I could, you know, just, you know, anything past a third, any past 600, I'm good to go, you know. Awesome. That's and right. It, it's just a numbers game, and you know numbers right. all. So yeah, but you also have to you have to have, have a relationship with radio. You have to have the right you know sound and light hook up, and right. you know you have to cut great deals with the venues, and you know you have to put together a street team for your flyers, and you know there was a lot that goes into it. It's just not as simple as making a phone call because that you have to do the groundwork, and if you're not willing to do the groundwork, then there's no way you'll be successful especially in, in, in concert promotions. How'd you get the foot in the door um, doing that after the promotion, promotions? Um, that's a funny story. So I'm at a club one day and there's a VIP from um, Motown Records in the house and her name was Janice Burrow. Okay. Um, so so the, she was sitting right next to, to me in a section and I noticed how rude she was being to the waitress who messed up her drink order so she's very outspoken mm -hmm. so i wake i walk up to her i say listen and i whisper in there i said i don't give a shit who you are i said you can't really talk to people like that i said so me and you you're not gonna go dance and then and if you don't dance then i'm just gonna try to embarrass you right here <laughs> she, now you gotta understand she's a big wig right so looks at me I extend my hand. We go to the dance floor, and we've been inseparable ever since. Thirty years of friendship. I love her to death, and I, I attribute my whole career to her because she, she then would say, "Hey, listen, I'm going to a music conference. You know, uh, I bought you a plane ticket. Come on, right. or you know, you know, I'm, I got Smokey Robinson here. I got Stevie Wonder here. So I'm hanging out with Lionel Richie, Smokey, Steve, all the Motown acts. And when it came time for me to put out Daisy Dukes. I knew exactly who to call. She had a friend named Barbara Thomas, and I said, Miss Barbara, can you help me? So Barbara would then help me put together, you know, a list of radio people that we could go to. And, you know, between Barbara Thomas and Janice Burley, they they literally, uh, they made they made my career. Now, this is gonna be funny. 
one of the the the, the people that I that I really have to thank in terms of helping me with my first distribution there would be Betty Wright. Okay. Um, Lord rest her soul. Uh, Betty was able to 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 introduce me to Al Bell and and the rest is history, you know. Um, and and I met Betty because Betty stopped at, at a music conference that that Janice had invited me to, and she says. Oh my God! You look like like my baby's father, you know? <laughs> and, and and she had six kids with her, and she said, "Watch my kid for me, and I'll be right back." Mm. So I, I'm, I'm I turned from I want to be music guy to a babysitter, right? Yet she had to go do something really quick, which is like within you know I I, I just and she and it went on to ask me what I did, and I told her, and I said I'm a big fan, blah blah blah, and. And I said, I got this record. And she said, well, I know the right person that you need to talk to. And the rest is history. So three powerful women can take can take credit for my career. Because if it wasn't for Janice Burley, Barbara Thomas, and Betty Wright, I would not be here. Awesome. Awesome. Let's talk about, we're going to move on. We're going to move on through the line. Let's talk about the face records. Okay. What what was your, uh, the, your official title there? Or I'm sure maybe it changed over time. When did you start? What's the title? That's really interesting because my title, I don't even know what my title was because I didn't answer to anybody um, except for LA. Right. But me being in the AR department, I had a really interesting deal. Um, the face would give me the, the ability to travel all over the country, pick up acts, sign them to Tony Mercedes records, and then sell them back to the face. Uh, <laughs> oh, nice. So it was, it was really interesting. And, yeah. And, you know, and L.A. Reid, uh, would, would, I would watch what he, he did because he would he would make moves and he taught me what stars look like and he taught me how to recognize a star and, and blah, blah, blah. So I, take, I have to give him a lot of credit for, for what he did. Now, I didn't always agree with everything, every move that he made inside the LaFace house, but I realized that I can never tell another man how to run his house. Yeah. And he, he created a company from, from nothing and turned it into a, uh, like a billion dollar business. So I have to take my hats off, I hat off to LA and, and, and because he, he mentored with me without having to even know that he was mentoring me because I was watching and right. absorbing, absorbing you know, the knowledge, watching the moves he made. I, I watched how he walked, how he dressed. I mean, I would, I would mimic the way he carried, carried himself because it's like I was walking in some big shoes and and I remember L.A. asking me, he says, well, man, what is it you want to do? I said, I want your job, you know, and and that was that was the truth. I mean, yeah, I yeah. wanted to be you, you know, so uh, so as far as and other people that, you know, they were living check to check. But when I came to the face, you know, my mentality was, well, I'm already pretty, you know, I already got some money. So it's not like um, the, the, the check don't mean anything to me. I, I'm here because I'm making the transition from being independent to now being being corporate and, and figuring out how to maneuver inside of that corporate world and still keep my 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 uh, my independent ideology in terms of how I move. I was gonna get to that a little bit later, but now since you're there, this I want to know this. I think everybody needs to know this. You, you have Tony Mercedes Records, right? Where Give us a quick education. Labels, sub labels, parent labels. For instance, on, on some information that I got for you, it'll say Tony Mercedes uh, Records parent label LaFace. Others say, um, you know, both LaFace and and Mercedes is and Tony Mercedes is a sub label, and a parent label is Sony Music, right? You, you, Give us you know, how does it work and and help someone who, who knows nothing. Help them navigate that, what they need to know coming in, hearing that, uh, you know, for your own personal business and in general. Well, okay, so the industry will sell us on the idea that where you see Tony Mercedes slash LaFace slash Arista. But the reality of it is it's just a glorified production deal because for it to be an actual label deal, then that, that would imply that I have ownership in a master, which I don't. Okay, okay. So a lot of us felt victim, and we, 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 we got the cloud of being, you know, uh, bad boy record slash era. So, well, Puffy never owned any of the masters. Really? Yeah. No, no, like, wow. he didn't own it. Aristotle owned that. 
reality sets in when you find yourself doing a deal with a company and let's just say hypothetically they say, well, Tony, you're responsible for 50 cents of, 50% of what it costs to do business. And, um, and let's say they, they put that number at $2 million. So if I, if I ever get into the green, that means record sales that I sold made enough for me to pay my $2 million in terms of expenses. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Yeah. Okay. So once I be, once I turn, once I, once I'm in the green, that means I paid that too much. And but, the problem, but, but the problem is if I paid that 2 million, then when you ask me how much of the intellectual property, Tony, do you own? My answer is going to be zero. How, well, if you, if I pay 2 million, why don't I own half of the master? I paid for it. Right. And that is the, the, the thing about the music business that I always tell people, you know, um, that's, that you got to be very careful on how you structure your deal now because when I was doing those deals I was doing those deals uh, and I didn't realize till later that those kind of the, the kind of deals I did it was proof positive that the regular business was never intended for people of color to make money mm. okay mm. instead of four acres and a mule they give us a big house and a bins, but we always wind up giving our masters to the master okay mm. um, but you know but with, with the internet now, the internet has leveled the playing fields. So now a person like a soldier boy can, can, can do a record and, and do it independently and create a frenzy based on his marketing ability by using the internet. Yep. And I have, have, have taken his formula and, and it really um, upgraded it to the point where it is, it is a, it is just a proven that you can introduce your own income revenue stream to your music without ever signing a deal. And I think that that's where that's where people need to be at right now, you know, because, you know, I think the labels are, are I mean, depends on what you want. Now, if you want to be famous and and and, and, and have a, a machine behind you, and I'm not opposed to it because sometimes some artists deserve that machine behind them. Yeah. But a lot of artists, they sign these contracts, the first line in the contract, it says, I hereby do sign and transfer all my rights. So when yeah. you sign, you have to realize that you're saying that everything that you went, all of you, everything you went through in life, all these stories that you're about to tell in your music, you're transferring those rights over to somebody else. Yeah. And then they find out they find out later on that they don't even own their own Instagram. Page. It's just it's a it's a, it's a tough one. So I, I I try to I try to teach the new generation that you know there's an alternate way to, to, to look at this business, and there, there's some healthier alter, healthier alternatives if you're willing to do the do the work and learn. You know, a lot of them want they, they want to make the money real fast, but they're not learning anything. You know, and and the blind can't lead the blind. Uh, right. Doug, I never seen Stevie Wonder lead Ray Charles nowhere. Nope. <laughs> that's a reality. But that's why we have the show, though. That's exactly why. That's exactly why you're here today, which is why it's so important to me. Um, what was the atmosphere in La Face when? Number one, talk about what that's like. The experience, the mood, when L.A. Reid is going to take over Clive Davis' position at arista the parent company right now that's the that's the masters was it was there jealousy was there oh man uh we're having the first black man to head the highest grossing label at the time <clears throat> that was big was it sideways looks was it a big hug what was the atmosphere at, during that transition we didn't really get a chance to see what was going on behind the, door, behind the closed doors but we knew that one of ours, which is L.A. Reid, was getting an opportunity that would create other opportunities for other people that looked like him. Mm -hmm. So we had to apply these efforts and we had, we had to, to, to back his play because it was important that he succeed. Um, I, I, you know, w one of the things that I found to be really funny is I think it was BMG who decided to make a move on Clive and because Clive was old. And yeah. it's an the young man's business, you know, we got to retire Clive Davis. Right. And Clive was smart enough to say, you know what, you can take all my acts, but just let me have this one little 15-year-old, 16-year-old girl. Her name was Alicia Keys. And I thought, yeah, you can have Alicia Keys. And then Clive would go on to start J Records and sell five million records on Alicia Keys. So. <laughs> you know, it was important that for, for, for everybody to know that um, L.A. was the epitome of what success looked like. Mm -hmm. as far as being uh, an executive and and we had the ability and we had the, the privilege of working right next to him 
being able to say, I speak to him every day and shake his hand. We didn't realize that, you know, LA will go down in history as being one of the most iconic and influential black entrepreneurs, executives in, in the record business. I don't care what anybody says. Let's look at the fruit that was bearing from that tree. When you look at somebody like Pink, who went on to be an incredible pop star. Yes. You look at somebody like Usher, who went on to be an incredible R&B star, still working resident, still making a fortune out there on the road. You look at people like KP, who worked for an a &R, went on to work, he works with Pharrell now. You, you, know, you look at people like Dallas Austin, who, who was like, like a, not LaFace, but LaFace, because we're all family. I mean, uh -huh. he went on to do great things. I mean, you look at um, uh, Outkast, they're still, they're still prominent and, and they're still iconic in the business. Um, they're still relevant and they're still doing their things. And like Tony Braxton and TLC still touring to this day. So they're still eating off the things that they did with, while they were under the LaFace umbrella. Yes. So when you, when you look at it from that perspective, you know, that man changed, he, he, he was, you, when you look at Atlanta and the things that Atlanta w went on to do, if, it, if there was no L.A. Reid, Atlanta would not be popping to this day. This L.A. Reid brought all the eyes and attention on Atlanta Georgia through LaFace Records. I don't care what nobody says. He put, he made LaFace a place that you need to look at when, when you look for talent. That's why Atlanta runs the hip hop game. They, they run the music business. It is down south that we run it. Period. But, but you can't say Down South runs anything without mentioning the, the name L.A. Reid and Babyface. I'm sorry, you can't. No, you can't. And, you can't and there, was, there was a wise man who, who was at a Grammy award ceremony who said, the South got something to say. Uh, absolutely. And that was, there's a, there's a protege from, or, or, or a product, or, or a, a link in this chain that we're talking about from L.A. Reid. Okay, I want to go to here. I want to go here. Talk about the Ed Sheeran record. How did this happen? Because I'm hoping we also get into some other names here that I, that well, I know what's coming. Okay, so so the, I got to talk about TLC's No Scraps. Good. So I'm in the studio. Uh, a guy named Tricky Stewart over at Red Zone is creating a song called Who That by JT Money. So I go into the record. By the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. I go into the studio. And I pass a guy named Kevin Shakespeare Bridge. He's got a cubicle on, on the left side. And I see Candy and Tiny from the group Escape. <clears throat> and I hear this record called No Scrubs. And I'm like, I stop. I'm like, yo, whose record is this? So Candy says, well, that's me and Tiny's record. We started a new group called Cat, K-A-T, Candy and Tiny. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, two things. Number one, y'all still under contract with So So Deaf under Escape. Right. <laughs> and then so it doesn't really work like that. You can't just up and decide you got to start a group. It don't work like that. <clears throat> I said, and number two, this record is is bigger than an upstart group called Cat. Yeah. She, well, what do you mean? I said, well, <clears throat> what I mean, Candy, is you need to let me take this record and pitch it to to, to TLC. Right. Candy, TLC ain't gonna do our record. I said, Candy, let me work. Let me do this. Is what Tony does. I said, I just need you to trust me a little bit. Trust the process a little bit more. I said, and if you do that, this this record will change your life. Candy is now a multi-millionaire yep. because because that record opened up the door for her to win a Grammy. It opened up the door for her to do Beyonce, Celine Dion, and the list goes on and on. She owns I don't know how many restaurants in Atlanta, how many clothing stores in Atlanta, how many different brands, and you know she's on the Real Housewives of Atlanta. So it was that one record that changed her life, you know. And it was funny, May 20th in Billboard magazine, I forgot what year it was, I want to say 1999, mm -hmm. Tony Mercedes Music, which is my um, publishing company, would be listed under the, the number one pop record in the country, the number one R&B record in the country, and the number one hip-hop record in the country, all in the same week. A lot of people can't say that. <laughs> no, they can't. Nah. <laughs> they can't, Tony. <laughs> all right. So, so, so hold, 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 fast forward. So then 20 years later, I get a phone call from Warner Chapel, who was my uh, publishing administrator at that time. And they said, hey, there's a guy out of Europe named Ed Sheeran that, that wants to know if you'll clear him using the melody from No Scrubs. So at that point, I'm like, well, who the hell is Ed Sheeran? Yeah. Today, 2023, I will tell you there is not a gay homosexual bone in my body. Right. If the white boy knocked on my door, I'm gonna kiss him right in the mouth. <laughs> okay, you get a big kiss from me because 
that record would go on and just do yeah. astronomical. And I always, tell, I always tell people, publishing is the is, is the gift that keeps on giving. Talk about and, it to them. Talk, give it, give it to me. Give, <clears throat> give me that that publishing game, man. Well, the publishing game is Ed Sheeran cannot ever use that record in a movie, in a film, in a TV commercial. Uh, in anything without my signature okay that's the power of publishing mm. so and and publishing is the bloodline of the record business because it will feed you when 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 the fans stop coming to your concerts you get what i'm saying so i always tell artists don't give up your publishing yep. you know you already don't have the masters yeah right don't give up your it, it's the blood um and it's the kind of it's, it's the money that you make in your sleep so, you know, all you have to do is, if you can just wake up, guess what? You made some money on your publishing while you were sleeping. You just have to, you just have to wake up, you know, and that is the power of publishing. So I would, uh, you know, to me, it's like, understand, like, I would give me a great songwriter and I'll give you, I, I'll let you have 10 artists that, that, that are hot today because that great songwriter will make sure, well, that great songwriter has a bigger value than 10 hot artists. Yep. Wow. Outstanding. <clears throat> I seen I seen a guy. I remember when Dream first came to Atlanta. I mean, I remember he couldn't put two, rub two quarters together. Mm -hmm. I remember he couldn't afford to buy a Happy Meal. I remember he was sitting on in front of another producer's couch named B Rock. He was sitting on his couch and I was like, "Hey man, let me get this man something to eat," because he was doing a hook for me. He charged me two hundred dollars and did a hook for me for one of my artists. And if you look at Dream today, he is easily worth ten million. Mm. Because because of his, his his writing ability, he went on to write some incredible records for Rihanna. I mean, he wrote the Umbrella record; that was his first record. Oh wow! Yeah. And wow. believe it or not, that record was never intended for 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 Rihanna. It was intended for somebody else, and they just happened to turn it down. And one of the girls that worked in the face named Karen Kwok, who then worked at Def Jam, uh, she 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 put the record on this new Belizean act that they had, which was Rihanna, and the rest is history. You know, again. Karen Kwok was part of the face, and you. This is another extension of, of the fruit that we were talking about. It's incredible, man. Wow. I mean, we could go talking to music with you could be all day and all night, but there's something else that I drill into all of my students, okay? And that's that you seem to master this. If you want longevity in the entertainment business, you need a diversity of entertainment. I'm not sure how many people know that you somehow managed one of my favorite comedians of this generation, Tiffany mm. Haddish. How did that happen? Tiffany Haddish and I met on the set of an independent film called Three Wishes. And, okay. uh, and you know, we got to talking and, and you know, me, I'm like, Tiffany, you need a manager, you need somebody like me. And she's like, you think you can help me? Yeah. So we had a mutual friend named Sean Ross. And I said, hey, I called Sean. And Sean talked to Tiffany and said, hey, I'm co-signing Tony. Tony's, you know, he's, he's solid, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, I'm managing Tiffany Ash. Uh, and I managed her for three years. I negotiated her first Tyler Perry deal. I negotiated their NBC, the Carmichael Show deal. And, and a host of other small little, little independent films that she'd done. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that I'd always told Tiffany, I said, listen to you. I said, I'm always going to do what's in the best interest of my client. And a lot of people say that, but sometimes you get put to a test. I remember Tiffany calling me one day and she says, hey, can we meet? Yeah. She says, well, I got an offer from this company and they get their, they're, they're willing to give me my own Showtime show Ooh. and this, that, and the other. And I said, T, I said, remember when I told you that I'm always going to do what's in the best interest of my client? Wow. I said, I said, they don't want me nowhere close to you because they want they want to take my act. I said, now, as opposed to me making it about me, today I got to make it about you. Wow. Because I have, to, I have to do what's in the best interest of my client. I said, I can't match what they're offering. Right. I said, it's time for you to spread your wings and fly. And she cried. She boo-hooed. And I said, no, it's not. Today we don't cry. We celebrate. I said, because you're going to get the opportunity to get I mean, that, that I believe he deserved. And um, and boy, did she fly. Wow. And and I remember calling, her calling me when Girls Trip came out, when it came out, when the numbers came out, it was number one in the country. 
and she just thanked me profusely and said, hey, Tony, thank you so much, you know, because I had to do what was in the best interest, interest of my client and I had to release her from my management agreement. Um, and, and believe it or not, everything we had was verbal. I mean, like, that was how close we were. You know, like, Tiffany and I were super, we're super close, close to this day. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, when, whenever I call Tiffany Haddish, the phone doesn't ring twice. You know, I tell just by how you're talking about it that is that your first uh, comedian manager that you managed? Uh, my first comedian, yeah. What did you learn? What did you take away from that? Um, well, I learned that 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 I still had it, no matter what business I was in. I still had the ability to to see the future. And I remember Tiffany calling me, and I was managing her for a year, and I never took a commission. And she says. Can you meet me? I need to give you a check. I'm like, Tiff, I'm good. She says, no, Tony. She said, you've been by my side for a whole year. You never asked me for anything. I said, Tiffany, I know big day, bigger days are coming, and I'm okay. I'm willing to wait. She says, so she says, please just meet me. She gave me a check for $2,500. And, and I wouldn't have taken it, but it meant something to her. Yeah, yeah. And But I believed in her. And I believed, and I told everybody. I mean, Tyler Perry, if you ever see Tyler, he'll say, you know what? Tony sent message and said, man, this girl's going to be great. And he, and he said, I really wish I would have listened to what he said because I would have signed her to a five-picture deal as opposed to just letting her do one of my TV shows. You know, it's just, just amazing. This actually goes right into that. That shows the type of person, because not only we're we talking about diversifying comedy, TV, film, I, I see that you partnered with people like the Salvation Army, right? H, the H two H two one Give Back event. I think you yeah, posted it d d during 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 the COVID days. You know, I wanted to do anything I thought I could do to, to help. You know, we, we were handing out sanitizer to to the homeless and people. You know, we, we just wanted people to try to be safe. I me. Mean, that's the heart I'm talking about, man. That's what we, like you know, you know it's it's. I always tell people it's like. Do something for somebody that can do nothing for you, that has nothing to offer you. To me, then then you're really giving from the heart. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I bought, I don't know, 100 cases of sanitizer and we just, you know, and I partnered with, with H2, H2O and we just gave them away. We, we set up, you know, I'd have my artist go and walk to, to you know, to, under the bridge and we'd stop and give them, you know, sanitizer and say, hey, listen, we just want you guys to be safe. And unfortunately, the people that I was giving the sanitizer to, they looked like me. Yep. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And, and what stopped me from being them? Opportunity? Or, you know, yeah, maybe I just, God bless me. You know what I mean? So, but there's no difference and when I see a homeless man sitting at a corner, and it 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 hurts because that person could be me. But for the grace of God, right? Um, I mean, and in the broader sense, if you could if you could impart something to the people listening, to to one person listening about the importance of giving back when you've reached up to a place like where you are today in the broadest sense why why is that important for what reason or reasons the bible says and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm i'm very spiritual but the bible says to whom much is given much is required okay. yeah to whom much is given much is required so you know i can't sit back and say that everything i did this is all me because no you know, I, I I know. Forget forget about the accolades. I know from where my strength comes from, and I know that I couldn't do this by myself. And and when God blessed me to have some of the things that I have, uh, it it you know I know that I can afford to bless others because you know this is not going to change my life, but it will change and impact some other lives. So you know, at the end of the day, it's just pieces of paper with dead people on them, you know. But I can't let that be the thing that that makes me wake up in the morning. Sometimes it's not about profits, but it's about purpose. 
so I'm purpose driven. So I do things, especially in my older age, when I know that the t my time clock is ticking. I don't want people to remember <clears throat> me for just being a guy who did a record here or there, but a guy that cared enough to do something, you know, just do something. What can I do today that's going to help somebody? Yeah. You know, and <clears throat> it's an emotional thing for me, so. No, I, I've, I've, I can tell, man. Um, in the whole past, the past segment that we've been on, I can tell the emotion in it. And I, I think that you have to, people have to see that because there's so many snakes out here, man. It's so many. You know, that to see a unicorn like you, the inspiration that it's given me, I know it's going to do that to somebody else, man. I know like it's I said, to somebody else. I'm not perfect. Never claimed to be. Nobody you, know, is. you know, I've been a pimp some days and I've been a host some other days, you know. But when it's all said and done, when, when you start winding down and you have to really look at what do you want? What do you want your legacy to say? I don't want it to say that I did a couple of records. That means nothing. That helped nobody. You know, it helped me, helped the artist, but it didn't help. It didn't help a, a nation that's in need of healing. It didn't help the people that's on Skid Row. It didn't help them. You know, but we can do some things that to, to ease some of the pain. You know, and like I said, I, I give a lot of I, I give a lot of money away, and and you never would you would never know that because I do it from here. It doesn't matter what the public, they don't need to see what I do. Yeah. You know, I don't need to publicize it so I can get the the, 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 the credit for, or the, man, you know, when I saw your video, man, that's, that's dope. No, I don't need you to see anything, man. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't believe in conversation, I believe in demonstration. And, you know, you know, you get what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. what you say out of your mouth means absolutely nothing to me. I watch, I watch how you move. You know, it's not your conversation, it's your demonstration. You know, and I don't think that things are accidental. I think they're providential. So, but I'm, but I'm on that, and I'm on, I'm on a totally different page. So, you know. And and right now, <coughs> because of who you are, we're gonna do the drink champs. I'm gonna give you your flowers now because you don't ask for them. Okay. I want you to talk about. I want you to talk about your newest artist. You're putting it out there. You're putting your stamp on it. I have four artists. Um. I have Roxanne Luciano, who is a female rapper. People always say, well, how long have you been working with her? And her <laughs> I knew this was coming. I didn't know if I should ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been working with her my whole life. I mean, she's my child. Yep. Uh, and she she picked Daisy Dukes. She's the reason I put Daisy Dukes out before I put the other record out. Because she's kept, every time she'd get in the car, she would say, Daddy, can you play the Come On Baby record? Right? Okay. So she, she was an a person behind that. Wow. Uh, Kylie Marshall was yeah, Kylie Marshall is, is a 14 year old. She's 14 year old right now. I met her when she was 12. And I went on YouTube and I seen this little girl with uh, 93 views on a YouTube page. Now, people in my position, we, we don't, like, once we see that number, we keep it moving. Right. And remember I told you about that, that, that the ability to, to see in the future? Mm -hmm. I saw, I saw, I saw, uh, I saw unlimited possibility, bro. And she's, just doing some incredible stuff. So you know, keep your eye on Carly Marshall. One of the things too, I have a, uh, that I you don't hear much about, and I have an artist named Jarvis Red. Jarvis Red is, if you go on TikTok, uh, his TikTok has blown up over eight hundred thousand new followers in the last seven days. He he's a black he's a black guy out of uh, Milwaukee that sings country music. Oh, <laughs> yeah. so, okay, Milwaukee. Yeah, uh, yeah. so yeah. he's in the Midwest. Yeah, and he sings country and music. high in the Midwest, he's back, yeah. back on near Canada, and he sings country music. He and sings black. country music, and he, he, he did a, a, a cover on, on a uh, Tim McGraw record. And Tim McGraw was so impressed that he came, at it, came back and did a duet with him and said, it is discerning to, to watch somebody sing your song better than you can. Oh. And wow. from, there, from there, Jarvis' uh, TikTok just, I mean, took, went over a million, you know, Subscribers was ridiculous and CMA started following him and he's got some incredible things going on and so I'm super proud of, of him and, and just keep remembering the name Jarvis Red uh, and then lastly I have a, a kid named Elijah Diallo 
He's out of France, and we're doing an international deal uh, with a guy named Akala, who is uh, putting together a whole uh, UK. We're shooting the video. We're gonna shoot part of it in LA, short part part in the UK. It's gonna be incredible. He, he, so yeah, so, so so it's pretty interesting. A lot of people don't. Know, I mean, I'm, I'm actually believe it or not, I'm, I'm meeting with uh, this um, artist named Black China. You familiar with Black China? Oh yeah, we were gonna, we were gonna get to her. Yeah, I'm, I'm meeting with her tomorrow, uh, and uh, so we're having a, a, a possible me actually representing her in oh, wow. all of her endeavors, and we're going to sit here and, and we're going to change the, change people's perception because what I thought she was about, I realized that she's an incredible, incredible young woman, uh, very very talented, very smart, and she speaks eloquently, and she uh, she's incredible. So. Um, uh, let's see what happens with that. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about that. I'll put that on the back burner because we're going to do this again. I tell people all the time, get, I, I need you to get out of the music business and get into the business of music because it's two different businesses. I heard you say that on a podcast. I was listening. You know what I'm saying? So it's so, so, so super important. So every day to me is, is, is a teachable moment for me, you know. And I always tell people, hey, listen, you go into a room and you're smart, just as smart as everybody in the room. That only means one thing, you're in, the, you're in the wrong room, you know. And it's very important for a young artist to know, and this is probably the last thing that I'll say, uh, you have a better chance of getting drafted by the Atlanta Hawks having never dribbled the basketball than you have being having a successful rap, rap career. Yeah, you know, and I want you to think about that. The NBA p picks up around 275, 300 players a year. Look, look at the Billboard charts, top 50. You, you might have one or two new new names that you see, so you have a better chance of signing on to the, be, to be on the Atlanta basketball team. I've never dreamed of them being. I successful. run a studio in Atlanta, and I can tell you that for sure. Every day, every day. Um, this is the part I want to get serious. I want to get a little bit serious. Um, not too long ago, yet another child star, turned pop star, turned troubled artist, Aaron Carter, who passes away, 34 years old. Uh, li listen, we did all right. So we did a tribute for him. I'm trying not to get emotional. And and uh, and our host, Carrie Tedder, he's on Broadway. Uh, he actually did some stuff. I wouldn't say with him, but he, he was a part of the life of with him when, when he was in New York. And so, um, and he was, he was talking about, he was just questioning it. A whole society's desire for the younger and younger celebrities. Um, quite frankly, the, to the toxicity of the entertainment business and requesting the wisdom of putting our kids, like he came in at seven, between seven and nine years old. Right, and we're the machine putting them in this machine before they have a chance to have a childhood. So many times end up w like Aaron Carter, Britney Spears. Pick a name. With, Here's the thing. Wait a minute. With Kylie Marshall being fourteen, what are the guardrails? What are the guardrails, man? The heart that you have that 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 you put up to lessen the chances of something like this. How do you approach it? <clears throat> Is it even possible? How does that weigh on you, man? So I had a meeting with Aaron Carter about a month ago. Oh my God. Um, and Aaron and I sat down at a restaurant called La Petite in, in, uh, off Sunset Boulevard. And he said, hey, Tony, I, I really like Kylie Marshall, man. I wanna, I wanna do something with you guys. I wanna help her. He said, I, I, I would be honored if she would redo my song, I Want Candy. He said, but the only thing is I wanna be on the record with her. And I said, Aaron, listen, I don't think it's a good idea for you to be on the record with her, number one, because you're, you're an older man. She's a young girl. Yeah. And, and I don't want them to misinterpret what candy means. Right. I said, so let me ask you, I said, when you did that, what did, what did candy represent? He said, well, he said, when I did it, it represented cocaine. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind is, you were like, who was, who was supervising this kid at 15 years old that allowed him to do cocaine? Or, 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 or didn't recognize that your 15, the 15 year old is doing cocaine. 
So we never did get the record, but he did send Kylie a message and he, he, he talked about how proud of the, how proud of her he was. And um, and and we 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 would go on to have a conversation, and he would order another Shirley Temple, because I don't care what people say, that boy was really trying to <clears throat> to get it right. He was fighting a, he was fight fighting a, a, an enemy that doesn't play fair, you know. Um, but for him to sit there and order Shirley Temple, I knew he was trying, you know. He lost the battle, but. I'm not gonna let the world say that he was this bad kid. We all make mistakes, but let's point the finger sometimes when the finger needs to be pointed at. Let's point the finger at the people that were supposed to be watching him, supposed to be making sure that he went right as opposed to going left. You know, where's the responsibility for them? So. His mother was his manager, man. Let's be real, brother. Not, well, I don't know who was his manager when he was 15, but, in, in, you know, no, but, that... but, but I'm, I'm heartbroken. It's important to me to bring that up to you. I know you have a 14 year old on the roster <clears throat> and it's a tough one. And I, and those guardrails got to be there and someone hearing it from you, uh, it may just help, man. Well, again, you know, when, when a family trusts you to to manage their child, you know, a mother and a father, they huddle up and they trust you to manage their child. And it is my responsibility to make sure that I micromanage everything that I know everybody who's sending her a message who's DMing her. I know, I know everything that's going on in her social media. I, I know I want to know what her grades are. I want to know, you know, I, 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 her father gives me weekly reports of what she's doing in school, how she's doing in school. Um here recently, uh, uh, she she was a victim of bullying. A girl that weighed about 175 pounds uh, just beat her unmercifully at a park, and and they sent the video around, and I have the video. And from that, you know, we created a song. I, I remember telling Kylie, I said, you know what? People oh like that who bully you, they don't really hate you. They hate themselves. They, they hate that every time they see you, you remind them of what their life could be like. So at the end of the day. I, I guess they just wish they wish they were you. So we, so I put, I put that was. A, remember I told you I don't write songs. Yeah. That the time that I I put the pen to a piece of paper and I and I and I wrote a song and the hook is, I just, I guess you just wish you were me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an incredible record. Uh, and you're gonna hear about it and you'll be like, damn! I remember when he told me about it. It's not even done yet. Wow. But but the record is incredible. <laughs> and exclusive. And and, and and for me, it's like. You know, you hear about bullying, but I saw it. I saw this little girl, defenseless little girl that weighs 100 pounds open, yeah, but come just on. being dragged through a park, you know, by her hair and just punch after punch after punch. It was heartbreaking. And they're, and they're taking a video of this thing. Like, yeah. listen, we have a whole nother show to do, brother. I know. Okay. So we got a whole right. nother show to do. We got to do one. Uh, Real quick, I want to end it. I don't want to end it on that, man. I want to end it on this. I'm honored that you blessed me with, with the knowledge, man. Everybody is blessed with the knowledge that you're given today. Thank you for coming. I got one more question, and I'm going to end it on a fun one. How the heck did you get into the World Series of Poker, brother? How long have you been playing, and what's that experience like? Oh, man. you know, World Series of Poker. The yeah, Series yeah. Edition now. It's okay. They, yeah. they said you was the youngest looking one. <laughs> I mean, whenever I walk in the room, the cameras go up, man, because it's like, at first of well, all, Actually, I'm a super senior now because because you got to be 60, so I'm 60, and I don't I don't look at but yeah, I'm no, 60. I'm not, come on, man. I have the ability to be super senior, so it's it's really amazing. Um, but you know what? Playing poker is, is not about playing the cards; it's about playing the player. Yeah, so I've always partner, heard that. I don't play. I I don't yeah. even gamble. And, and, I don't even buy lottery tickets. But yeah, yeah, no, I've so, heard about it. And so it's a skill set. It's it's about having the ability to be able to to read a person. Mm -hmm. Just like in the business of management, I can read people. I can, I know how I, I'm a chameleon. I turn into what I need to turn into to have a conversation with a person, especially when I'm I'm, I'm trying to create an avenue for a deal or something. So, poker was just it was already. I mean, I just had to learn the, the rules. And my wife Tamara actually laid in bed and said, "Hey, I can be great at poker," and she taught me how to play poker. And from that, I went on to to go into the World Series. I remember playing my first senior tournament and 
out of 4,219 people, I finished number 88. So I finished in the top 2%. And it was incredible because uh, can you imagine being in a room with almost 4,300 people and I'm number 88? Wow. Um, first time, you know. Wow. Yeah. Brother. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that, I thought that was just, I was flabbergasted. Man. I was like, this dude, and you know what? Of course you would, because every time you look across that business table or in a meeting or a negotiation, you're playing poker just without the cards. You're reading people. Yeah. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much for bringing me on the show. I appreciate it. Um, I, I hope that that, that 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 they learn something. But uh, but I but I appreciate the fact that you took time to, to spend with me and, and allow me to tell my story. That way, you know, when history is written, I, I get a chance to, to write part of it because these are my words and this is my story. And I'm thankful for you, uh, Doug, for allowing me to come on your show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody, I want you guys to know Tony Mercedes. You're watching the MCs unfiltered, unedited, unscripted. My man. <laughs>